Hey, good afternoon and welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. My name is Michael Dongle and I'm one of the chief medical residents. Today, I have the honor of introducing our Grand Round speaker, Dr. Charles da Jaffe. Dr. Jaffe is an expert in the field of medical informatics and the chief executive officer at Health Level 7 International, a global authority on electronic health information standards dedicated to providing a comprehensive framework and related standards on the exchange, integration, sharing, and retrieval of electronic health information. Dr. Jaffe earned his medical degree and doctor of philosophy at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. He, he completed internal medicine residency at Duke University and fellowships in allergy and immunology at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and hematology oncology at the Lombardi Cancer Center in Washington, DC. He's a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, the American College of Physicians, and the International Academy of Health Science, Sciences Informatics. Over the course of his career, Dr. Jaffe has had numerous roles in academia, research, and industry. He has held academic positions in departments of medicine, pathology, and engineering, including professor of medicine at the University of San Diego. He's also led a national research consortium, found a consultancy for research informatics, served as a contributing editor for several journals, and published on clinical management, informatics deployment, and healthcare policy. Prior to joining HL7, Dr. J Dr. Jaffe was a senior global strategist at Intel, Vice President of Medical Informatics at AstraZeneca, and Vice President of Life Sciences at Sciences, uh, Science Applications International Corporation. He is currently a board member on leading organizations for information technology standards. Today, Dr. Jaffe will, pre will be presenting on how health data standards make patient care faster, cheaper, and better. Welcome, Dr. Jaffe. Thanks, Michael. Uh, first of all, I wanna start off by thanking uh, the University of Miami, uh, the Department of Medicine, and uh, Ken Goodman for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here and uh, a pleasure. Um, Ken asked me to describe my last 12 hours in which I was trying to mediate a vitriolic dispute between the academics at the uh, Korean National University and the uh, bureaucrats at uh, the uh, health department at, uh, uh, for the entire country of Korea. And not speaking a word of Korean, this was a challenge, even for the best of us. So um, I'm delighted to be here and talk to you about this. Let me give you an overview of how the next 45 minutes will go. Um, the um, discussion will be broken down into uh, six or seven specific areas. Um, I'll serve really a, as a highlight to a discussion or a Q&A at the end of this. Uh, this 45-minute uh, presentation was actually a 10-week lecture for the University of California Health Systems and um, uh, the University of Texas Health Systems. And so we did a remote training program, um, try to uh, narrow that down into things that are pertinent uh, for the Department of Medicine and for the uh, Division of uh, Bioethics. So uh, how did I get here and why is this even vaguely important to me? Well, as you know, the Institute of Medicine published a report about the problems that we have in delivering quality care. Uh, to err as human made an important impact in the lives of uh, many of us. Uh, but a more recent uh, Johns Hopkins study uh, estimated that a quarter of a million Americans die from avoidable medical errors, which makes it the third leading cause of death in the United States. So I wanted to tell you my journey. Uh, it's really about Jack. Jack was a, a unique young man, um, a student athlete and uh, with a great promise he went to his uh, family physician with knee pain. And this is the x-ray that uh, they got from Jack. 
Um, his family doctor said he never saw the x-ray or the report. And this is the chest x-ray uh, when I saw Jack, uh, the pathology of which was uh, metastatic osteosarcoma. And so from that point on, I was committed to no more stories like Jack's. Um, I think the foundational essence of this really emerges with the development by HL7 of open APIs and the FIRE platform. And we'll spend the next 40 minutes or so talking about how it's created and what is the impact of that in the care delivery paradigm, research and public health. So I'll highlight uh, vaguely a description of FIRE, why it's important, what we're going to do to transform the way we uh, uh, share data. Um, Benjamin Disraeli is known for a lot of things, but uh, twice Prime Minister of England uh, is most notable for saying that there are three kinds of lies. There are lies, there are true lies, and uh, there's uh, data. Uh, I, I think we have a promise, and some of the promise can be framed in uh, the way uh, health informatics has changed uh, clinical data sharing. And so in the future, um, and I think the, the process is even ongoing today, uh, we will have all the data that we require uh, in the workflow of clinical care. Uh, our patients will get care based on evidence-based medicine. Uh, Larry Weed, who was a, a idol for many of us and the father of the uh, problem-oriented medical record, realized that the difference between uh, clinicians and pilots is that they put their lives at risk every time they uh, step in an airplane, uh, and we don't have that same demand. Uh, more importantly, clinical decision support, not the way it's often viewed today as uh, annoying alerts, but true clinical decision support will be the fundamental way that we deliver care. Uh, Chris Shute, who is a colleague, a friend, and the chair of medical informatics at Hopkins, really summarized it well. Our research communities won't be uh, straddled with the double-blind placebo-controlled trials, but really uh, real-world data. Uh, I, I was on the podium recently with the senior VP at one of the big biopharmas, and when he said uh, that his drug was 80% effective, I was polite and quiet till we got off the podium. And then I said, well, 20. And he said, okay, uh, 70. And I said, 50. He said, okay, 50. And so, it's a problem with the way clinical trials are designed, and real-world evidence will change that. I think almost importantly is the integration of social determinants of health into the clinical decision-making. So often, uh, at the point of care, we don't have the data available, uh, the patients may not be forthcoming, and we miss a lot of opportunities to provide the best care we can. Uh, I think we're beginning to see changes, and HL7 FIRE has been at the fore of this around compensating physicians for outcomes. Uh, for those of you who've been to the uh, Prado in Madrid, this is one of my favorite all-time paintings. This is uh, Napoleon's invasion of uh, Madrid, and these are the resistance fighters whom his fusiliers are executing. Uh, it doesn't have to be this way. 
Um, HL7 is really a 40-year-old organization. We've been creating standards that deliver information for probably half of all healthcare data in the world. But with the advent of HL7 Fire, been an important change about how that process takes place. Alan Kay, who, if you're really an old timer, you remember the K-Pro luggable uh, laptop or desktop, whichever you define it, but he was really at the forefront of making changes to computing. And I think we have the opportunity to make those changes to healthcare. Uh, if you recognize this device, you're older than I think you might be. This is a Newton. And back in the early 90s, I actually wrote a program for the Newton to capture uh, research data at the point of care. What was remarkable was that in 1993, it had rather reliable handwriting recognition, even mine. Um, one of the challenges that we'll talk about over the next uh, portion is really how is this interoperability going to be achieved, particularly when uh, the policy and the other formidable opponents of interoperability, often financial, um, stand in the way of making it happen. And I think uh, the argument boils down to is there a business case for interoperability? And uh, from Ken Goodman's perspective, can we actually uh, uh, fail to achieve our ethical goals if we don't have interoperable health data? But in the process, uh, Sanders development has its challenges. Um, I think this is more true than ever. Um, and while the anecdotes uh, surrounding this are myriad, I think cheap, flexible, and interoperable is really the story that we have to tell. Uh, I think at the end of the day, this is all about change management. I tried to use this slide at the University of Moscow. I was actually struggling to give this talk in Russian. Um, and when this slide came up, I had vaguely translated this to Russian and uh, not a single person thought it was even vaguely funny. So I, I stopped giving talks anything but English. Um, Charles Kettering uh, made all his money by inventing the windshield wiper. Uh, and he took some of the proceeds of that enormous profit and uh, help create uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center. Um, we have regulatory burdens that get in the way of standards development and standards implementation, frankly. And I think the uh, regulatory authorities, particularly in the United States, are becoming increasingly aware of this and have now partnered with HL7 uh, to help in the standards implementation process. We'll talk more about that later. And then there's the issue of you put two standards development organizations in the same room and someone proposes a third standard. Uh, uh, harmonization is an anathema to this process. Then we have terminology. I uh, won't begin to say I understand what my terminology colleagues are talking about, but I can tell you that we haven't figured out the right words to use. Uh, one of the practical realities is even as clinicians, uh, we can't get the words right. And here is a review article in which these uh, papers uh, about asthma really didn't have viable definitions of the condition. So um, nearly a decade ago, HL7 stood up a project called Fresh Look and said, you know, we have 
achieved some success, were recognized around the world, but it really isn't what we hope to achieve. And at the end of the day, uh, from emergence uh, of concepts, sharing from other industries, recognition that healthcare was at least two decades behind other industries, the concept of open APIs and HL7 Fire was born, fast healthcare interoperability resources. And so the best way to describe the concept of open APIs is the way you make a travel reservation if you go to Travelocity or one of the aggregator websites. And you book a flight from Miami to Chicago. Heavens knows why you want to go to Chicago, but let's say you do. And on your screen appears all the airlines, the flight numbers, the schedule, the cost, uh, reliability, and so forth. And that data doesn't exist anywhere but in your browser window because uh, Travelocity has enabled all of the open APIs from all of the airlines to serve as an aggregator uh, for the health data. And by the way, that's why uh, your screen refreshes every five minutes when new data is found on the um, airline websites. But even more importantly, perhaps for some uh, parts of the healthcare community, uh, FIRE defines the meaning of the terms. Now, you say, what meaning is so ambiguous that it has to be defined? Well, let me venture that uh, at the University of Miami, you may designate uh, gender as M or F, and uh, at the Miami VA as 0, 1, or 1, 2. And it actually takes a translator to uh, share data about some demographic as uh, apparent as gender. Um, and then the enormous uh, responsibility how you're going to transport the data. So 10 or 12 years ago, there were uh, four or five different solutions. And now we have uh, a tremendous increase in the capabilities, not only the ones that FIRE provided, but the ones that our collaborators, such as the cloud vendors, have enabled. Now, all standards have a maturity. Um, one of the unique um, instances of FIRE is we actually uh, value all of the single resources, and there are about 175 of them now in uh, how long they've been used, where they're used, whether they're implemented in a commercial project, whether uh, universities and health systems uh, value them. And so you can look at any component of FIRE and understand uh, uh, how reliable it'll be uh, moving forward. Uh, in addition, uh, FIRE is more than just a transport layer or a terminology layer. So uh, World Health Organization uh, relies upon HL7 for developing a core uh, set of data. The um, uh, critical topic, which I'll only touch upon later, is uh, prior authorization. Uh, uh, with the collaboration between HL7 and CMS, we're able to uh, do real-time adjudication of prior authorization using FIRE endpoints rather than the onerous uh, exchange of claims attachments. And lastly, part of FIRE is what we call bulk FIRE. So no longer do we have to rely on a single patient, single uh, clinician paradigm. We can send hundreds of thousands of records over a rather narrow pipe so that in the cloud or in some other uh, system, we can analyze the data. In fact, um, there have been uh, reported studies whereby uh, 
600,000 records were analyzed and they were able to accurately predict readmissions for congestive heart failure or emergency room visits for diabetic control. Fire is really not a new idea. Here's the uh, graphic timeline of fire in which you can see that uh, the Jason Task Force, Mickey Tripathi was the uh, uh, co-author of that task force report, now the national coordinator. And in that meeting in the fall of 2014, he said that the future of interoperability was um, open APIs and, and fire. It wouldn't have been a reality had not uh, fire been adopted by Apple. They developed a pilot program early in 2015, and now uh, fire is actually integrated into the operating system of Apple. It's not an app. And so it allows you to aggregate clinical encounters, imaging, uh, laboratory data, all on an iPhone in which the security and privacy is relied upon by the uh, patient. Uh, over the ensuing uh, decade, uh, there have been a host of milestones, including in uh, December of 2022, when uh, Health and Human Services through ONC said that uh, all electronic health records had to have fire endpoints. And I think a remarkable one occurred only in January of this year when CMS announced that in the future, um, all uh, claims and prior authorization uh, would be uh, uh, mediated through uh, HL7 fire. Um, one of the important things that I couldn't miss saying was that like all of our a, a IP, uh, fire is completely free. Uh, it's hard to sell anything which is free, but let me assure you that it's released through Creative Commons. Anyone is entitled to use it. Uh, we just ask that uh, the end user respect uh, the HL7 fire trademark. Fire wouldn't have been successful without a community of people to implement it. And I think uh, what has been so successful has been the intimate collaboration between uh, this arcane standards development organization that is HL7 and a broad community of government agencies, academic systems, and the private sector. We had a program which we call Partners in Interoperability. And what was remarkable, to, excuse me, to come out of that was an agreement between patients and providers and insurance companies that we could share data using FIRE. And I can assure you that in my career in California, we sued, I don't know, Blue Cross maybe 20 times. And here we were sitting down at the same table saying, we have a common need for clinical data. Um, the biopharma industry, which has been so long uh, mired in proprietary exchange data, finally embraced the use of FHIR for real world clinical trials. But even more than that, uh, post-marketing biosurveillance, and most recently, integration of genomic data into clinical trials. I think at the forefront of this has been a number of government projects, uh, uh, the most prominent of which is Sync for Genes, in which uh, the large genomic databases are being integrated into workflow uh, through the capabilities of FHIR and its clinical decision support capabilities. Also have a unique uh, interest in integrating uh, device data. So it's not only the ventilator uh, that, by the way, the respiratory therapist has to set the date and time 
every time she or he turns it on, but also the wearable devices, the implanted devices, uh, pacemakers and the like. And so it really uh, foreshadows an important change in the way devices share information with health information systems. Uh, the government agencies have been phenomenal partners in this uh, journey. Not only CMS and the FDA, which I've also recognized, but the Center for Disease Control had a remarkable program, which they called Death on Fire. It was about uh, morbidity and mortality reporting using fire endpoints. There are 3,000 uh, health uh, agencies in the United States, 1,500 of which report their health data by printing out Excel spreadsheets and faxing them to Atlanta. So this was a way of, of uh, reducing the complexity, the number of steps, uh, the people involved, and getting data to the agency in real time. We also uh, collaborate with a host of other standards development organizations. I think part of this is recognizing that everyone has something to contribute. Everyone is remarkably unique. And regardless of what impressions we had, uh, they make the changes that are important. So I bring here a quote from Mia Hamm, who's one of my heroes. Uh, in the process of this, HL7 had been developing standards for nearly four decades. And we said, well, what about implementing them? And so three years ago, we began an implementation division. If you look here at this uh, Fibonacci spiral, you'll see that at the center, which I've labeled as number one, is uh, a community of perhaps 2,000 people worldwide who even care about standards development and care about creating the fire spec. But as you move outside the spiral, uh, the number of people involved, the number of organizations and communities grows exponentially. And so uh, at number five, we have uh, tens of thousands of implementations worldwide. In fact, uh, HL7 provides free uh, to large swaths of Central Africa uh, fire resources to be able to care for 300 million Africans. And in the Indian subcontinent, about a similar number of Indians receive all their care through fire endpoints. But it wouldn't be successful if the standards development community and the standards implementation community couldn't uh, collaborate. So here is a schematic, perhaps a little busy, showing the journey from the lower left-hand corner where the process begins of uh, standards development and the virtuous cycle of a learning health system whereby the successes and failures of the implementation process feedback on the development of further standards, uh, all of which is integrated within the HL7 home. And in doing so, uh, we've collaborated with over 40 organizations with whom we have um, memorandum of understanding, uh, participation in a daily basis, uh, not only do, does this occur in a um, global sense, but we do training um, on fire worldwide. Uh, this month alone, we did fire training on every continent, uh, well, not Antarctica, and our Ar the Arctic Circle uh, was a little chilly last month, but in fact, uh, we gave those classes by native speakers in um, Mandarin, uh, Urdu, Spanish, and English. 
We have a remarkable community that we call fire accelerators. And each one of these fire accelerators has adopted a specific use case. Now, Argonaut is more than uh, four years old. Uh, they actually began before uh, the um, implementation division was developed or before the fire accelerator program got underway. Uh, the night that Mickey Tripathi announced the Jason Task Force report, we all met in a Greek restaurant to continue the paradigm. He said, well, the Argonauts will carry this forward to find the Golden Fleece. And the name of the fire accelerator has stuck. But Argonauts really been at the forefront of delivering implementation uh, worldwide, more than just the Apple Health Kit and bulk data, but clinical decision support, which is uh, my golden fleece. And more recently, such things as writing fire back to the electronic health record and fire for imaging. So here's an example of the CDS hooks, the clinical decision support. An order is written for toporal. It initiates a trigger uh, seamlessly in a context-aware sense. Uh, it uh, accesses the clinical decision support services, and it actually goes and looks beyond your organization, and it can examine information, databases, and so forth that it exist outside of your immediate community. And it feedback onto the clinical encounter and gives you information such as, wow, toporol costs a lot if patient has to pay for it. Or a suggestion which is perhaps uh, propranolol will work in the setting that you're looking. And if you'd like to learn more, here's a URL that will link you to that information. I think the second most exciting one to which I already referenced was Da Vinci, in which the payers and providers have uh, actually uh, worked hand in glove. Now, a lot of this was driven uh, on the payer side by CMS, whose rulemaking has been able to establish uh, the relevance of this since they pay for roughly half of all healthcare in the United States. But these are the other providers and payers, as well as the electronic health care vendors that are responsible for the exchange of data between uh, the payer and the provider system. Another exciting one is Codex, which actually began as a oncology use case about patient care and research, about defining terminology, about linking the data to the patient care environment, and has now grown to include use cases and large projects around both oncology and genomics. And at next week's uh, uh, US CDI uh, conference in Washington, uh, Codex will be front and center. One of the remarkable things that they've been able to do is to define a workflow for integration of genomic data into the record. I live a long walk from Illumina, who is maybe the 2,000 pound gorilla in this discussion, because they create not only the equipment and have all the databases, and they have little or no interest in interoperability. That's someone else's problem, but this is a solution to circumvent that. FAST is a uh, infrastructure play. It actually began at the Office of the National Coordinator at HHS, where it lived for three years before it began as a HL7 fire accelerator. And it really serves as creating infrastructure for other organizations. Now, the uh, government agencies partner in this process on more than just a technical level, at a strategic level, at a resource level, at a uh, human level, and also in an advisory capacity, without which 
I don't think we would have been successful. Um, fire is also uh, a global phenomenon. Uh, not only is it recognized by the uh, health regulators, uh, the health um, organizations in 50 countries, but also by the standards development organizations, which really have an imprint globally. Uh, we were able to coerce an agreement out of AMA, for example, to allow the free use of uh, CPT codes uh, in the uh, FIRE test suite. Uh, SNOMED has agreed to give uh, uh, the SNOMED codes uh, for use in Apple without uh, the funding licensure. Both of those are moot here in the United States, but worldwide, it's really an important one. And lastly, Odyssey, the um, uh, data model for clinical research and HL7 partner in a rare uh, exchange of, of ideas on making the HL7 data model for FHIR work with the OMOP, uh, I mean, the, the data structure work with the OMOP uh, data model. Um, lastly, uh, partnership with Harvard and Boston Children's Hospital to create the smart platform, which really enables all the apps to be used. Not only does it provide a layer for security and authentication, but also as a jumpstart for making the apps um, function as standalone entities. Now, all of the uh, EHR vendors, or at least the big half dozen of them, uh, have their fire libraries, which they've certified as uh, apps that work seamlessly with the electronic health record. This is an interesting one. NCPDP, the National Council for Prescription Drug Programs, are the people that adjudicate brick and mortar prescription claims. And this had been an absolute nightmare until they decided to sit down and say, oh, uh, perhaps we could do this with fire endpoints and now reduce the cost, the time, and the infrastructure required. I mentioned the collaboration with uh, Odyssey uh, to make OMAP on fire possible, but I don't think it would have happened and it wouldn't have been quite so successful without the uh, support of uh, NCATS, uh, which funded the effort. Uh, we have partnerships with almost all of the uh, professional clinical societies, uh, important uh, not only for clinical content, but also for workflow, business requirements, and clinical needs. Uh, this supports not only the evolution of vocabulary, but also the use cases uh, for supporting interoperability. Uh, remarkably so, uh, we share the copyright and trademark with all of our partners. Uh, here are some of them that actually support HL7 uh, and FHIR. If you uh, went to a, a VIVE or a HIMSS meeting this year, uh, on the floor, all the vendors were FHIR now and all the time. It was an exciting moment. Um, and we partner with the EHR vendors. When I announced uh, the Argonaut project in January of 2015, uh, it created uh, an uproar and they said, you don't really think that Epic and Cerner will work together. Well, now they work seven days a week on advancing the capabilities, integration, implementation of fire, as do the uh, big consultant organizations, uh, some of which have a uh, half billion dollar fire implementation program. The uh, NGOs worldwide uh, collaborate with us. 
uh, MITRE for implementation, particularly the Codex project class for uh, uh, quality measures and the World Health Organization for a host of opportunities in uh, what they refer to as the Global South, which you may recognize as uh, second and third world countries. Fire wouldn't have been successful if it weren't uh, usable within the cloud. And six years ago, uh, we met on a stage in uh, part of the White House, actually, and announced that the cloud vendors would be sharing uh, data between uh, the clouds and from the clouds to provider organizations using fire endpoints. Uh, but now they've agreed to use bulk data on fire so that uh, hundreds of thousands of records can be uh, transmitted to the cloud and analyzed or manipulated uh, in that uh, environment. Uh, Fire would not have been successful had we not developed a security layer, which in fact is just the adoption of ISO standards OAuth 2 and OpenID for authentication and security. Um, we now partner with uh, uh, DARPA, the defense agency for hardening uh, fire security and with other organizations for reducing uh, fraud and abuse. Um, today, uh, we've begun a, a program that was really nascent within HL7 for more than four years about uh, AI on fire. And uh, generative AI, as many of you realize, is the Wild West. Uh, one of my favorite cowboy movies. But um, anecdotally, uh, three of the four in this picture and all of the Earps died in gunfights before they were 30, except Wyatt, who actually married his sweetheart and is buried in a nice Jewish cemetery in San Francisco. Um, we have partnered in the Coalition for Health AI, I think, it's really important because it'll serve as a framework for enabling um, AI in a secure, ethical, um, and um, manageable format. Now, this couldn't have been achieved without huge uh, representation across uh, the public and private sector. Uh, many academic medical centers, uh, industry and government agencies led by the FDA are at the heart of driving this. Uh, HL7 has adopted three specific areas for standards development to enhance the safety and reliability of AI, uh, whether it's uh, machine learning or generative AI and these around uh, fraud and abuse, around provenance, which I think is really critical. So if you have uh, output, whether it's uh, um, AI for imaging or um, pathology or even clinical summaries, you know the provenance, you know the origin, uh, you know the data sources, from which the uh, AI uh, was able to generate meaningful output. Um, as we move forward, uh, we'll need collaboration from everyone. Uh, this is not a uh, one-man show. And uh, whether it's from a defense industry, uh, whether it's from an academic health system, or from an IT vendor, uh, this is more important than ever. And I think whether we limit ourselves to the uh, traditional kinds of AI, which have really been around since the 1950s and have been used sporadically, or 
generative AI, which has a tremendous opportunity if we recognize that uh, you can quickly generate a million clinical encounters for $200, which would uh, get below uh, Medicare's uh, fraud prevention dollar amount and would be paid uh, for patients that don't exist or clinical care that was never provided. Uh, I think the ethics of AI is multifactorial. Um, in a sense, my colleagues and I often debate this, but we confuse ethical and moral. And uh, that's going to be a challenge as we move forward. I think the opportunities uh, that are afforded with AI uh, have to be measured against the risks uh, that it places on all of us. Uh, AI, in my view, will uh, encourage innovation. It's not about the simple uh, framework that uh, AI is capable of achieving. I remember in my clinical career, I would send my pathology specimens to AFIP. It was like an early version of AI where a dozen pathologists would be looking at it rather than the world-renowned expert at my university. And lastly, uh, just because we're good at something doesn't mean we're good at everything. I learned that uh, the hard way, and you can say uh, painfully so in my uh, seven years at Intel. So we're embarking on this journey. We'd like you to uh, share with us in the process. As we move forward, we have an ambitious timeline for FIRE. R5, which has been released, will be balloted uh, in a few months. One of the important things about R5, even though R4 is required in regulation, is subscriptions. Uh, with subscriptions, once you've asked for a lab result or an image, anytime that patient with her or his consent uh, provides the access, you'll get updates, you'll get the information, you'll get the clinical encounters about that patient. So whether you're the primary care physician or in tertiary care, you'll be informed of the data and Jack's story won't repeat itself. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity, tell you that uh, FIRE is just in its infancy and we have a lot of uh, opportunities that uh, we envision as we move forward. And most of them will be driven by the implementation communities who found uh, the uh, paradigm is meaningful for their use. Uh, worldwide, um, we've been recognized uh, as a digital global good. I think it was important because not only uh, our uh, uh, providing fire free of charge around the world, but also the changes that it's making in patient care and uh, in science. So we college graduates, I often say, can remember three facts in 45 minutes. Here are three of them. Fire is fast. Fire is global. And fire is free. So um, I, I learned this uh, little uh, uh, parable uh, some time ago, and it's more real now to me than ever. A delusion held by many as a culture, held by a few as a cult, held by two as love, and held by one, yours truly is psychosis. So thanks to my colleagues who made this possible, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Michael? Thank you very much, 
Dr. Jaffe. We appreciate this uh, Grand Rounds. And uh, I uh, welcome anyone to ask their questions in the chat. Please check the chat for the link for the CME and MOC credit. Thank you again, Dr. Jaffe. Everyone have oh, a I didn't. Oh, uh, I didn't assert my conflict of interest status. I apologize. I try and do that at the beginning. I don't own anything or work for anyone that would provide a real or apparent conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, everyone. Actually, Chuck, one of the things that I, I don't know if people are still listening, that our colleagues our colleagues write notes in Cerner and Epic, depending on which side of the street they're on here. And for most of them, it's a box that's more or less painful to use. That's the way they manage billing. It's the way they keep notes. And some of the notes, as you know, are, are perhaps less than what you might have hoped for. What I, what I was hoping uh, that you, and you did it brilliantly, is make clear to all people who are practicing medicine and using these tools that behind them is a vast, a vast infrastructure of people trying to make them better. Uh, the terms of interoperability people sort of know about, but but the idea that people have learned about HL7, fire, and other sorts of things makes it clear that when we're talking about decision support, if all you're thinking about is alarms and alerts that you're turning off, you've missed a fair amount of what is possible given given uh, the evolution of, 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 of the technologies that we're talking about. Is that your experience elsewhere? Do you find a lot of people already knew about HL7, fire and all the uh, stuff? Or So I used to say, if you've ever heard of HL7, raise your hand, that maybe a decade ago, uh, three people raised their hand. And then I said, have you ever heard of fire? And maybe five years ago, a handful of people raised. Now I ask, who has a fire implementation program? And often the whole audience, I. I spoke at two AI conferences uh, in the past two weeks, and it was astounding the number of people that wanted to use uh, the FIRE platform. Let me say that the clinical decision support is my cause celeb. So not only does it provide clinical decision support, but if you're encountering a patient for whom there's a clinical trial, CDS hooks will pop up an alert saying, are you aware that there's a trial available in this uh, disease setting? Would you like to see the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Would you like me to print out an informed uh, uh, a consent document? And so um, it is not your uh, father's um, clinical decision support, which was annoying drug-drug interactions. This is far more vibrant and capable. I'm glad to talk about that in the remaining five minutes or whatever anybody is interested in asking about. Mike, you want to um, identify the um, questions from the audience? I think they may be shy. So one, one of the things, well, yeah, so University of Miami is, we have a new department, uh, uh, albeit a very small and inchoate department of uh, for data and, and, and informatics. Um, and it's been something that the institution has been striving for for a while. The questions you're inviting are questions that I think people say, we want more forums to learn about this stuff. If all I know is I got to use the EHR to document my notes, then you've missed uh, an important part of what's been happening in the world for a very long time. And I, and I, uh, my hypothesis is simply that, that when it comes to this, when it comes to some of the ethical issues that you raised, um, our colleague, we're, we're, we're trying to get our feet under us. What, what are the ethical issues that arise when you have point of care decision support? Uh, and, and does that change for medical students, for nurses, for, for residents, for senior attendings? Uh, when in fact there is there are reimbursement and there may even be liability concerns about about using an intelligent machine. So there's evidence that we uh, clinicians in practice use information that's 17 years old, and so unfortunately, some of you extremely remarkable residents will move into the private care setting and 
fail to stay up to date. I'm not a naysayer, it's just a practical reality. And the clinical decision support capabilities that are now inherent within the EHR will change that. You don't have to rely on what you remember are the best therapies for status epilepticus or what are the first line drugs for primary hypertension in a uh, patient over 65 and so forth, because the CDS tool will have not only uh, the data, but the evidence behind the data. Uh, so you can look at the articles, you can see the National Library of Medicine uh, Medline. Uh, all of that is available to you right at the point of care. Now, you can take advantage of it, or if the workflow demands, re refer to it later, but it serves not only as a care enhancement, but as an educational tool. And I think that's uh, invaluable. Fact, one of the things that I, some of us have thought about, I know you have for a long time, is, is the role of a good decision support system in education, uh, including self-education. I mean, there are a lot of things that one could do once one gets one's, one's sense of how it is these tools might actually be used, uh, as opposed to it's a box you type your notes into. What, what I think a lot of our colleagues are, are, will be glad to learn more about is there's a huge network of people around the world trying to make these electronic health records better, uh, more effective in patient care, bring the information that you actually want for your patient uh, to be easily useful uh, when you need it. That's so far been elusive for, for many, of, many of our institutions. Uh, I see it's 559, sorry, five, it's 1259. Um, Dr. Huber, anything to, anything to add? Uh, I just yeah. uh, I don't know if Dr. Weiss is still here, um, but but he asked Mike and uh, and me to to pull this together, and given our mutual interest in the intersection of of informatics and the challenges that it raises, uh, asking Chuck to come and do this was was a real privilege. Dr. Jaffe, thank you so very much for making time for us at the University of Miami. Thanks, Department. Mike. Thanks, Ken. Thanks to all of you.